Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Groupthink. If this is your first time joining us or you need a reminder, Groupthink is one of our conversation series at Civics Unplugged, where we take a topic and we start with a burning question and we just have a conversation about whatever feels meaningful related to that topic. Um, and we have we are joined by a few of our builders. Um, so I'm Madison and I'm a high school senior from Verders, Oklahoma. Does everyone else want to introduce themselves before we get started? All right. Hey, everyone. I'm Mariam. I'm also a high school senior, and I'm from the suburbs of Chicago. Hey, everyone. I'm Ashley. I'm also a high school senior from Vancouver, Washington. Hi, everyone. I'm Zoe. I am likewise a high school senior, and I'm from Lexington, Kentucky. And hi everyone, I'm Chabu. I am a first year in university and I live in Toronto, Canada. Yeah, Toronto. Chabu Vakey. Um, I'm Gary, I'm one of the co-founders. I'm in New York City. Cool. Um, today we're talking about media and I'm gonna share my screen. And Gary had a very good idea for uh, something for us to get started off with so we, we can do like a word association um, so, so, so yeah, how do you want to do this so I, I'm wondering if, if there's a way we can avoid influencing each other's answers and then only like sharing it out like after so should we um, should we just like pick a place to write it down or just track it in our head yeah, yeah I think either if you want to write it down or keep it in your head, and then we can just um, okay. So we should this might be good for like thinking of questions as well. Yep, exactly. Because people can just kind of draw like connections between words. Mm -hmm. Um. So let's give it like a minute then. Okay. Sure. How many words? Would be like three. Yeah, three would. Be and it's words we associate with media, not necessarily like words to describe media. Whatever comes to mind, I guess. Right. Okay, cool. Could we do phrases too? Yeah. Medicine. Okay. It's cool because um, such a big motif, I guess, of CU is talking about words. Okay, does everyone have their three words? Cool. All right, anyone want to yeah. shout out theirs first? Sure. So my three that came to mind were um, online information and circus. <laughs> I like it. The cool thing about <clears throat> these sort of exercises uh, or like prompts is that it's inherently meaningful because it's just it's just about like, hey, you are special and think in a way that can contribute to other people's thinking. Like the prompt itself, right, it can be so simple in that way. Uh, I can go. Um, the three words I have are propaganda, oligopoly. Whoa, how do you spell that? In <laughs> O-L-I-G-O, 
P-O-L-Y. I might be getting the definition wrong, but I think it's like basically the same thing as, it's like, it's like market concentration, but it's, a, it's with a Y at the end. It's a market, it's a market that is dom, no. <laughs> it's a market that's dominated by a few players that use their dominance to squash other like market players, basically. That's, that's how I interpret it. Sorry, Chabu, what's up? Oh, no, I was just going to say it's like a monopoly, but not just one person, two to three or something like that. Yeah. And decentralization. I can jump in. Um, I wrote facade, advertising, and hijacking thought. How do you spell facade? F A C A D E. And then what else? Adver advertising. This is so awkward. <laughs> <laughs> what else? And then, um, hijacking thought. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Hijacking thought. <laughs> Hijacking thought. Okay, I don't know. I'm just saying. Uh, H I. <laughs> I don't. I should not be the note taker. Ryan Madison. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's good. Um, I can go next. And I also just want to preempt that I cannot spell anything. And so Madison, you're doing really great. <laughs> um, so my three were narratives. And then I chose the phrase of selective information. And then my last one was personal. So good. Why, why, why did you say personal? I want to hear more about that. Um, because I think that like as much as media is like this big thing, the real the like where we focus on impact has everything to do with like our personal interpretation of media and then how that impacts like our collective interpretation of what's going on around the world. And then also there's the idea of like social media that's like a very personal relationship and that's just like your your personal relationship but like with the world at large. Interesting. I guess I will I'll jump in. Um, so my first, I guess, word is more of a phrase, and it's similar to what Chabu said, confirmation bias. Um, second one was profit. Um, oh, I'll give you a second, Madison. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. And then um, just go to as a phrase. And why, why did you write go to? Because uh, I think that... Um, when you, when you like can't figure out what to talk to someone about, you're like, oh, what do you watch on Netflix? Or like, what kind of music do you listen mm -hmm. to? Or like everything is just revolves around the media because that's, that's what we all share in common. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. So I don't know why I put and on some of them and I didn't put and on the other one. <laughs> I'm gonna delete this. Okay, um, so for mine, um, I have the same as Mario. I put like information slash news. I know that's two, but I um, put them together. And then talking. It's like, and um, then polarization. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys for sharing those and for bearing through my uh, spelling um, situation. Anyone have a question to start us off with? Um, I can, I, I have a question in mind. How has your view of, how has your view of the role of media changed in the past couple of years? Love this. Wow. I mean, like I can, a, oh, go ahead. I'm just saying it's like a good go-to question for like role of X, role of Y changed. That's just like a really great mm -hmm. type of question. How's the role of yourself? Uh, how's the view of yourself change over the? You know, that's end endlessly fascinating. Anyways. Uh yeah, I would just say, growing up, I never saw like. So when I think media, I think a lot of like the news, and growing up, I never thought of it as like, 
like, should I question, you know, what's being said? It's like, oh, the news is like, like the facts, the truth, and like, the, the uh, what you hear on the news is, like, like, they're people that you really admire, like, they're, they're uh, um, so I guess, like, it's just, the role has evolved, and like, becoming more, like, skeptical of, and I mean, maybe skeptical is not the right word, of like, not just taking in and um, like instantly agreeing with everything that I hear in media. Yeah, I, I actually just just learned the word for that discerning, being able to have the skill of judging the quality, validity, et cetera, of something. So you become more discerning. Um, I guess I can start off with like answering this question. Um, so initially, like in the past, I always just saw it as a source of information. Like it told me about the parts of the world that I didn't have like personal access to or didn't engage with every day. But really now I see it as, um, I think I see it more as like it's, its role is like depicting certain narratives. And that I think that media has a way of teaching, telling you what to know about something before you really know anything at all. So it's like the definition of just super surface level understanding, but as a society, we see it as like having a deep level of understanding um, based on like what we see in the media. I think one big way my relationship with media has changed um, is just understanding that like these are people who are trying to make a profit. You know, like people don't write news or like get on TV to talk about things um, for free. You know, like they're, they're being paid to do that. And so there are inherently different incentives when it comes with that. And that's kind of how I've had to reframe my understanding of bias because people were like, oh, well, you know, this news station is super biased. And I was like, well, no, look, you're, you're catering to an audience you get more views when you're doing what, like when you're reporting things that that audience wants to hear. And that just kind of like is a feedback loop. Um, so as much as possible, trying to distance myself from like getting in the loop of, oh man, I can't believe what that person said. And then only reading stuff from that one source about that. Yeah, I definitely like, just like agreeing with that and like also what Chabu and Mads like you were saying because before like I thought of the media as like this untouchable thing like this unbiased party I was like oh I want to learn something like look at the news see what's going on in the world and like those are like the scholarly people who know what's up um but like more and more I've been like seeing it as like an echo chamber of like thoughts so it's like oh like you enter into this side of the news and like you'll hear all of these same thoughts just in like in different ways but if you go on the other side then it's like the opposing view and it's like extremely polarized um and so I've had to like like we were talking about before like discern with my own knowledge but for me like that's been hard because if you don't have like information going into something then how are you going to be able to discern like what's spin versus like what's like actual facts so I think that is like something that I've had to like shift my mindset from like the news is a place to get accurate information versus like these are biased um sources of information that you'll have to take kind of like with a grain of salt. These are all like really different perspectives, but there's an underlying theme here of just skepticism. Mm -hmm like a growing need to be really skeptical of everything that's presented to us in media. And I really liked, um, Mara, and your point about like things being an echo chamber. And this is kind of a very niche example that actually my piano teacher raised and now I can't stop seeing it. Um, but a lot of news outlets have started using the phrase writ large, which means clear or obvious, <laughs> as though it means at large, and it's like cropping up everywhere. Like NPR is doing it, MSNBC is doing it, Vice News, CNN, all of these different groups are misusing this word. And I think it's just proof that you, I mean, I don't know why they're doing it, but you see it one place and I guess they keep doing it because they're like, oh, well that's 
another news source. They know what they're talking about. But now they're all just misusing this word. And I think that that's, it's the same way that like, I mean, incorrect news gets spread too, where, oh, the New York Times reported it. So that's got to be right. But then there have been numerous times where like they've had to retract articles. Like they said something about Kamala Harris being the first female vice presidential candidate in 30 years. And the people were like, Sarah Palin question mark. And then, you know, it's just proof that they're not experts. And we really have to understand that they're people who are just like us as well. You know, like I think a lot about like what ethical journalism is and like you know journalists are supposed to uncover the truth and like they're supposed to be unbiased and but like they are also just humans and essentially like you are trusting another human to do that making for you and so I think in terms of like how media has changed for me, I've like started becoming a lot more um, kind of like intentional about not just like the news sources I am looking at, but like who who is actually writing this and what is their like background. Um, Ashley, I think that's, a uh, really interesting point that you bring up and I was wondering if we could use that as a question like what does ethical journalism look like I mean is that one you guys would want to talk about yeah for sure um hi I'm Nuid I'm from Chicago um I just got here but um one of the things and this is like a weird connection because it has to do with college but um I'm, I'm applying to like a journalism school and um, one of the kind of like tours that I went on, um, like the virtual like interactive things that I did. Um, and it talked about like what, what can a journalist and what can't a journalist report. Um, and so one of the things they talked about was like, uh, if you were reporting something on 9-11, it's like what photos can and can't you use? Um, because I think that it's really easy to be disconnected from the fact that like there are people involved and there are lives involved and lives lost. Um, so that's one of the first things, just kind of like association that comes to mind is like um, the idea of what you can and can't cover depending on like some major event that has happened. I also think that like just like going off that that brought up like a really interesting point in my mind is like if you have to be an ethical journalist and you have to like understand your own personal biases and like try and minimize that as much as you can like when you're approaching a subject but like if you don't or like if your biases are like accepted or like in society or like if you don't even understand that you have biases and like are you just perpetuating those because like people are getting their information from you so like I don't know, I feel like certain things are like underreported on or like overreported on. And so like if people are getting their information from the news, then they'll keep seeing certain things and like keep valuing certain things over other things. Um, and it kind of like keeps per perpetuating a cycle. So I feel like journalists have a really cool role as like a conscience of the nation in a way. Like they, they're talking about like what people think is important and like it's kind of like a cyclical like motion. Um, so that's an really interesting point to think about, I think. Um, I think that when I think of ethical journalism, it also just seems like a constant process of self-assessment and also just like being open to being publicly held accountable because ideally journalism is like a reflection of the world at large and biases have such a big way of misconstruing information right and so being aware of your own personal biases and just self-assessing or being in spaces where other people can kind of check you so to speak is like integral to any version of ethical journalism and i'll say another thing with that is i think that 
at least in my opinion, some of opinion, some of the best journalism are those that are just telling stories. Um, and there's not really a lot, I guess you're hearing from the journalists other than they ask, they're asking the right questions. They know where to go to get like the right people to be heard. Um, and I think that those sometimes are the most transformational things. So you're actually hearing from people and like journalists use their platform to elevate like the experiences of other people. Um, but I think there are places for both where you need the, you need the analysis, but you also just need to hear it directly from, from the source. Uh, oh, sorry, Ashley. Um, that idea of like getting it from the source is really meaningful to me and like it like it makes me think about like fast and like slow journalism in a sense of like you know like hearing people's stories and like reporting them accurately and from the perspective like using the words of those people like it takes time to collect those stories and like gain trust of communities that you want to report on and like I just feel like there's this tension between like oh like we need to get out the news and like the news like needs to like be reported now and like because of that like I feel like that step is often skipped and we don't actually get to the stories we get to people's like assumptions or like whatever they take away from that situation but we like don't get to hear from the people actually experiencing something. Yeah to that point one of, there's a journalist in New York his name is Brandon Stanton um, and he started the Humans of New York like project where like it's literally just quotes, like quotes from, like, like he'll ask the questions and then he'll weave together their quotes um, so that, you know, people who are reading it can understand like the dialogue that's happening. Um, and I watched one of his interviews and it was like, how do you just get people to talk to you like that? Like, how do you get directly to that source and like to a point where they're comfortable sharing like really deep information with you? Um, and I like, some of his responses are like, you have to like, you know, make sure you're at eye level with them so that you don't seem like, I think he said, he's like, I'm like six three. And so like, sometimes I'm just like powering over people. So like, you know, getting down to their level, but also like um, opening yourself up as a person. And I think that's something that just lacks in general is like how approachable are you to talk to um, even in like a digital space. I love, 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 love Humans of New York. Um, and I have like the book and I follow them on Instagram. And there's also like another similar project where someone is on, ins it's like an Instagram page, but essentially what they do is just like, he meets people in random spaces and he's like goal is to make like 3,000 new friends or 10,000 new friends or something. Um, and I was able to like be a part of the project and like become a friend, so to speak. Um, but it's really interesting because like there's always something to be said by like the people he engages with. And so I love how like ethical journalism isn't necessarily flashy. Like there's a really s beautiful simplicity to it because it's not trying to push um, something dramatic or like misconstrue something so that it's like, you know, big and full of buzzwords and worth clicking on and so on and so forth. Um, any other thoughts on this or another question that um, anyone wants to pose? I don't know if this is another question, but something that Chadbo that you said like, oh, if it has to be like big or like worth getting clicks on reminded me of like um, an idea like what responsibility do you like journalists have to like the people that they are like reporting on because um, like I saw a project that it reminded me of like the Humans of New York where it's like a journalism brand and like they'll go to underreported places and like get those stories, but then they'll also like train the people, like if they're reporting on like women who don't have jobs, they'll also become reporters in those communities and so that they can continue reporting on the stories that aren't getting enough attention. So like they're influencing like the stories that they're talking about. So they're taking it like one level above storytelling. So I thought that was like a really interesting idea because I don't think that a lot of like I think a lot of journalists right now are just kind of like conveying information. Um, so I think it's like cool to think about like what responsibility they have in like um, changing the story. And I don't really know if that really falls under journalism because like some people are the storytellers and some people are like um, moving the story along if that makes sense. But 
yeah, I think it's cool to think about how those two can coexist. But I think that's kind of like falling underneath ethical journalism too. Okay, so, um, so like what responsibility? What what was it? What responsibility? Um, like, do journalists have to like the people they report on? Okay. I'll say that that's that's something where like when I've seen like certain kinds of pictures like from like areas with a lot of conflict that I have a really hard time like thinking like you just took a picture of that like what I, I like I would have the impetus to like address the situation but it's like you took the time to take a picture and then like photojournalists explaining like where the limits are of like you can't intervene all the time and that sometimes that that's a really like has a lot of weight on them. Like when you're taking like pictures and videos of things that are really traumatic and really like awful things, but you as a journalist have the responsibility to capture it and like report that out, not necessarily to act. Um, which is like maybe sort of related to the question you asked, but that's always something that I've, that would be a really hard thing as a journalist if you were reporting in those kind of situations of like knowing where the boundary is. I guess I answered a question. Like I almost feel like people should have the ability to like review what was written about them before it's published or like they should be able to influence the story in some way I guess like what I always think about is like even like when you do interviews with like a reporter you don't really control the story like the person writing your interview controls your narrative which is kind of twisted like I just feel like if you're the person being written about you should have some form of control over like what the story ends up being I totally agree with Ashley in the sense that like um, it's really important that I, because journalism at the end of the day establishes narratives and narratives are not to be dramatic but like almost the foundation of our society and how we like engage with one another going forward um, and what we deem as like worthwhile and all those things and I had a teacher um, and we were talking about like indigenous narratives and how things have like happened to like almost completely remove them from what's actually taken place and he basically was like there's um he asked he posed the question to the class of whether or not they should be able, like they should be able to write an article about like an indigenous issue and we all kind of like we're like oh yeah because like we've now established like our own personal learning revolving around it and you know would consider ourselves allies but he, in reality, the answer is no, because no one should be in charge of kind of writing your narrative but you or but someone who's like been a part of it, because it comes from like a more genuine place. Um, and you have a lot of like almost like lifelong context to the things that are taking place. And so you can be more empathetic and genuine as to what's going on. So I thought that was really interesting, too. Um, kind of like a related question. So like, instead of like, what responsibility do journalists have to people they report on? Like what responsibility do journalists have to like our society or like our democracy? I guess um, what I think of at least is that like there are a lot of people who like don't 
get who, I mean, you have a specific lived experience. You don't have the lived experience of everyone else in like our democracy. There's no way you can travel to every state in every city and like understand how people are living. But that's a unique opportunity that journalists have um, just given the nature of what they do. Um, so I think in many ways, it's informing the rest of us about how different people around the country are, um, like how, how they're living, what issues uniquely face them. Um, because if you don't like understand the other people um, like in your country, I think it's really easy to start you know, developing stereotypes and generalizations of, oh, well, the South is like that, or people in California are like this, um, because you don't actually get to meet those people, but journalists have an opportunity to kind of bridge that gap when other people can't. I think that, because um, democracy is essentially supposed to be the will of the people, right? And so journalism has a role in the sense that it, it tells us like the foundational information so that we can even pick a side or determine how we feel about it to establish the will that will be conveyed in the end. So I think that journalism is really important in our democracy. I think that this like also plays really like heavily into empathy and like dehumanizing people because like the way that you report on people that some don't have any information on will like influence the information that they get on those people so if you're just talking about a person like a number like oh this many people died it's like easy to start falling into those numbers and just be like oh well it was just one person I mean it would be it would have been so much worse like I've seen a worse story um, versus like actually telling the story of someone's life like that was one person who lived just like me or just like anybody else and so I think that like a lot of the times at least like even for me like I used to do like a radio speaking in speech and like I would have to report on stories and like my coach would always tell me like oh um why are you so like I don't know, like, enthusiastic about it, and I was like, I don't mean to be, and they're like, you're talking about, like, horrific things that are happening, and I was like, oh, yeah, like, I guess I am, and, like, it took me a second, and I was like, oh, shoot, like, that made me have, like, a big realization, I was like, okay, like, these are people's lives that, like, you're talking about, and I think that, like, in general, people can get really, like, lost in, like, the rush of, like, constant information that they forget that, like, these are all stories about people's lives, but I think that, like, humanizing stories is something that, um, kind of gets lost in the mix a lot of the time. I, I completely relate on that like radio point. I did it freshman year and like the high pitched voice, like the higher pitched voice didn't add to like, didn't help. Um, but one of the things that like comes to mind too is like, um, they're almost like professional journalists or not even this, but like there are literal professional journalists who like that's what they do for a living. Um, but I like to think that, like, almost anyone who has the ability to, like, either share on a lived experience or, like, articulate something that they find to be meaningful, um, I think that, like, that type of journalism and that type of journalist is important to democracy just to, like, give that alternate perspective or, like, reinforce an already existing belief or challenging an already existing belief. Um, so I think it's cool how universal that can be. Yeah, I um, I know I know like what you said reminded me. Wait, was was one of the words like oligopoly or something? Mm -hmm. Like I I think a lot. I mean, in a sense, like media. Well, media is an oligopoly. Like it's like it's owned by like a certain number of like media sources that essentially give us most of our news um and nor like what you said kind of just causes me to think about like we need more like locally based like community centered journalism where like because i feel like the people in the community have the context 
on like what is important to their community and I don't know I feel like journalism would be a lot more relevant if it was written by the people who were closest to the problem yeah as opposed to like someone flying in and like learning about it and like already local news is like way underfunded and like a lot of local news stations have had to like either shut down or like um kind of lower or like fire people and like lower their staff um so it's already being something that's like that's already threatened and i'll say something kind of scary that i read recently too is that a lot of local news like is owned by like the larger media conglomerates which I was like, I didn't realize that my neighborhood weatherman is, you know, being paid by like NBC, for example. And I was like, that's kind of weird to think about that. Like local news is not totally independent in the way that it should be. So from like, this is like one of the probably first or second um, unplugged conversations we ever had. But someone, I don't remember like what the context was or who even said it, but they said your local news spends more time telling you like who got shot last night rather than like things that are taking place in your community. Mm-hmm. And that totally blew my mind because like the place where we're supposed to go learn about our community is just like saturated in conflict, you know what I mean? And not even just like, if that's what's going on, that's what's going on and should be addressed. But I feel like it doesn't, like, the. it's just weird that those are the conversations that they continue to choose to have over everything else. I mean, that goes back to, like, what gets people the most clicks, right? Like, if something that is, I don't know, like, the more horrendous the news is, like, the more clicks they get. And I just, like, news is optimized for the wrong thing. Any other thoughts? Another question? I have a question. Um, What has media ever taught you about yourself? Um, And did you, like, was it something that you, like, clung to or was it something that you felt the need to unlearn? So I can start. Um, I think that media was like my first, was like a really big agent of socialization when it came to like understanding North American culture, Um, just because like my parents are immigrants. And so I like what was like the things that I was like used to at home were not like the things that were happening at school. And so it was useful in the sense that like it taught me about the communities I was living in. Um, But it, didn't really teach me like where my place was in that in those communities that I was living in and so the ideas that I picked up from that were things that I kind of had to like disengage with as I got older I think something that, at least for me, I unintentionally learned is I kind of became a headline skimmer um, in the sense that there's just so much news that I would decide, is this worth reading based off of the headline? And then quickly realized that the headlines that seem the most interesting are not necessarily the ones that are the ones, not necessarily the ones you need to read. Um, And so just figuring out, I think, just better ways to consume media that are, that are like is much more intentional so that I'm not just like swapped with a ton of different articles from a ton of different publications at one time. I also think like, and this is something um, at the like the very first um, kickoff from last year's fellowship, um, this is something Nick said, he was like, I used to just have like the news running in my classroom just kind of 24 seven. 
Um, and it almost became like background noise. Like, even though you were hearing these horrendous things, like it was like almost anticipated just because you had the news on. Um, and when he said that, like, I didn't realize how often I was doing that too. And so I think it taught me like, to Zoe's point to be way more intentional with like when I'm choosing to seek out that information and like where I'm choosing to seek it out from. Um, and also like this going back to like what Maria referenced earlier is like, remembering that the like what is being covered is like real people and like real people's lives um and i think that changes how you kind of view a story or a statistic or or like even a headline Just like one another thing that comes to mind and like what media has taught me about myself is um I guess when I'm only like one-sided about a topic because I feel like the like a lot of the people that I associate with have similar views as me um and like I don't necessarily like seek out people with different views as much as I should and then when I consume the same sort of media it just kind of again like back to this echo chamber idea like I feel like I don't get enough perspective and so one of the things that I've kind of learned is that like um things aren't always as like and yeah things aren't period I guess things aren't just like one side it's just like one side or the other side like there's a lot more in between and so like seeking out um that like middle ground is really important um and I think that like it wasn't because media taught me that it was just because like looking at the media I realized that about myself that like I didn't do it enough and like other people weren't doing it either so like I wasn't gonna get it from the media or most people um and so I guess like that's something that I've realized that I need to do more is just like see things from multiple perspectives and kind of like get that opinion to formulate my own opinion I guess one of the things I almost wish media taught me, I think that we've gone a long way in like representation and like getting, even if it's just like a kid looking at the news and it's like, oh, this news reporter like shares this similar characteristic or trait to me. Um, I guess like one of the things I wish media had taught me like from a younger age was that like, and it's the reason I want to go into journalism. Like I think broadcast journalism is really interesting because, um, well, I guess, I just, I guess, wish, I guess I had, like, I wish I had seen, like, a hijabi news journalist, like, on the TV from a younger age, because I think that um, it would have been, like, a more defining moment, just because, like, you see a lot of representation, but sometimes it's almost, like, token to be, like, hey, like, look at me, versus, like, I'm an actual real person, and this is, like, my literal job. Um, so I guess that's kind of a segue, but also just something I wish media had taught me. And kind of just to like comment on what Nora just said about how like media also has a way of like making a real, like a, a part of your personality or a characteristic that you have like the center of like who you are or like the most important or relevant fact of who you are. And I think that's really counterproductive, especially now that like we're entering an era where like tokenizing people is super common in like an attempt to gain more representation in spaces. Yeah, I definitely see that. Like, I hate, hate, hate the most when, like, media just, like, reduces, like, a person to, like, their, like, most diverse identity features, that makes sense. Or, like, oh, that's the hijabi, or, like, that's the Indian kid, or, like, that's the Asian person. Like, it's just so annoying when, like, it's, like, TV shows and media and, like, everything, like, you see it, like, repeated so many times. And, like, I get frustrated when people I actually interact with think those things. They're, like, oh, but you're this. Shouldn't you be, like, X, Y, Z? But then I'm like, well, if the media is always pushing it and they're never interacting with these people in real life, like where else are they going to get it from, I guess? So I definitely see that um, 
more representation and then not just representation to push the stereotypes that already exist, but just like representation, um, like real life representation, because not all like diverse groups are like a monolith, right? Like not, I don't know, I, I hate that that even needs to be said, <laughs> but um, I think that's something that people are still like wrapping their head around because I see it like all too much. So definitely agree with um, both of you on that point. Yeah, Mara, I'll just add that I guess um, I had to Google this word to make sure this was the like the word to describe what you're talking about, but essentially like typecasting people of like, oh, you're the black journalist, so you can talk about everything going on with Black Lives Matter and the rest of us will just kind of nod our heads and be like, yeah, which is like, it's it's ridiculous because anybody can have an opinion and even people within the black community have very different opinions on Black Lives Matter as does everybody because we're all just incredibly diverse regardless of what, I guess, like affinity group, your, your most diverse feature group um, is. Um, and so it, I guess very early on perpetuated that like, if you're this, then you talk about these sorts of things. Or if you're not that, then you don't talk about these kinds of things, which I think is, I think both are incredibly dangerous. And also just kind of like pushing this idea of what Zoe was talking about with typecasting. Um, it also like sets a limit on exploring those communities because like you almost like see them as like one dimensional and you miss out on like almost like smaller communities within them or like subcategories, so to speak. And then, so you're like almost like deleting other narratives that exist because you're so busy kind of just establishing the one that's like really solidified already. I think you bring up a really good point that it's like once these narratives have been like pushed for so long, it's hard for people to even understand that other narratives exist because it's like, oh, like outside of your imagination because they've, they've never seen it in real life. So I think that's really interesting to think about like how like people aren't even allowed to really like push the boundaries because like stories about people who are push pushing the boundaries like might not even be um, well received by people because it's just such a non thing I guess like nobody else is doing it and so like when there's like one lone story about something that nobody else really wants to hear because it doesn't fit what everybody else has been saying it just kind of like gets brushed under the rug and ignored. Um, something this reminds me of is the speech I heard I think like my freshman year um, and it was on news and like media and stories and one of the things he said was like uh, one of the things you'll commonly notice in media is these, uh, uh, like, uh-oh stories. Um, and so basically, like, the first time you hear it, like, for example, the headline is, like, oh, like, young, like, six-year-old cancer patient has, like, a lemonade stand that comes up with, like, the total money she needs for her treatment. And it's, like, oh, that's so cute. Like, her, her community came together for her, for her. And that's, like, the awe part of, like, the uh-oh versus, like, the oh part, which is, like, oh... Like there was something wrong in the system where they needed to come up with that money and they needed to like be the ones to give that to her instead of like a system that should already have worked for her. Um, and so like, it just reminds me of like the idea that, that sometimes we well receive stories that we shouldn't. Like this is not something that's necessary. Is, is it heartwarming that her community came together for her? Absolutely. Um, but does it reflect like a much larger issue that is really easy to ignore because of the story? Like, also, yeah. Wow. And I'll say to touch on something that Maria mentioned, too, of, like, we typecast people, so there are these narratives, and I think we also get, like, another kind of story where it's, like, like the unicorn, almost. Like, like if, if, you know, we think that this one group all behaves X way, but there's this one person who behaves this Y way, and we're just going to you know, spend a couple hours diving into why, why do they think that way? Everyone else who's like them doesn't think that way. Um, which is just such a weird, like, tokenization in and of itself. And almost like suggesting that 
it's wrong to be out of that group. And then that news coverage tends to be really negative as well when that does happen, which is weird. Yeah, that just reminds me all the time when people like say things like, oh, you're blank for a blank, like, oh, you're fun for like this type of person or you're smart for this kind of person. And it's like, okay, are we really still like in those narratives that like not that like you have to be like a certain type of people to be like smart or fun or something else like, um, but yeah, like I see that all the time. And it's kind of like, I like the way you put it, like a unicorn story, because it's like so feel good and everyone's like, yay, we're finally getting representation, but also like, is this the right kind of representation? Like, I mean, also kind of like puts like the communities that are being represented in like an awkward position because like you want to support like representation, but it's like at what cost? Because like, I don't know, I don't know if that's like relevant to anybody else, but I think a lot of the times like it's like, oh, well, I'll see this and I'm like, yes, like, representation but also like I don't want to perpetuate something but I also want to support the like slim representation that I do see so it's another thing that it kind of brings up the tech casting. Ryan brings up such a good point about the issue of like almost like the intersection of media on real life because when you step outside of the narrative that's being constantly presented, you're almost like in contradiction with the world or like it puts an extra emphasis on, emphasis on you and what you're doing than what needed to be there. Um, and so I think that like it's a really, really tricky spot to be in. And that's kind of like why it's so important um, that media media is like a genuine representation of people and who they are and the diversity of what they could be. Um, because when you fall outside of that narrative, it's a really tough situation to like even understand that you're in. To Maureen's earlier point of like, there at least there's some representation. I almost think like um, we've almost like been like gaslit into thinking like it's like oh what do you mean like you're not represented like look at this like model minority citizen that's on the news like 5 p.m central um but i think that you can still like like see an issue in that and i think what's frustrating is like it's expected that that's the representation that's being asked for so it's like or even being like pushed because it's like that's like you were so close and you almost hit the point but like you're just off by like the the, the smallest little margin um but so like i get where that 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 gets really frustrating. Um, any other thoughts on this or another question? I mean, I don't, I know that we were supposed to talk about the election. If you guys want to stay and talk about this for a little bit longer, you can. If there's not any more questions, um, I mean, we can wrap it up. Oh, it's up to you guys. I guess if people are ready to wrap up, I can contribute a closing question um, okay. of just where, I mean, like what, what media sources do you like to consume and why do you consume those sources? And I like how I, Madison gave up on the indents. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I can start because I, like this, this whole conversation has like really gotten me thinking about like what sources I do like. Um, and so one source I always love is Vice News. I just love when they go to these places in the world that I didn't even know existed and they're talking to people that I didn't even know existed. And I'm just learning all of these kind of revolutionary things about culture and different like world conflicts that you don't really see on like traditional cable news. Um, and they also just have some really, really magnetic people who do those, um, like, do those interviews and those stories. Um, so I just, I, I really like it. Um, and it feels more independent than, like, other news sources, though. Of course, probably when you look into it, it's not that independent. But it's always fun to watch. I really enjoy it. 
So I think I have um, two media sources that I find to be like super great for me. One of them is a newsletter that comes in like through email called The Donut. And it kind of gives you like both spectrums of an issue. So it'll like kind of describe the situation in like one or two sentences and then give you links to articles that are left-leaning, right-leaning, center, far right, far left. And I think it's really good because it just kind of goes, even just by reading the headlines, you see how like the interpretation of what's going on really impacts your understanding of it. Um, and also gives you the opportunity to kind of like look on the other side and see where they're coming from. And then I also think just reading books is a really good media source. Um, it's not going to give you current events, but it does give you an understanding of like, or a more personal context of stuff that happens. And I'm talking about more like novels and personal stories, not necessarily nonfiction. I think there's a lot of added value in that that's undermined because we have such a high value for current events and current news right now. Um. I'm with Zoe on Vice and another, I don't know if this technically counts as like media, but one of, I used to watch a lot of Anthony Bourdain because I think that like the intersection of like cuisine, which is something that's so like cool to me and like specific to very different people um, with current events and like social issues that are happening in those countries that he visits or visited. Um, I think that it's really cool to see that, but it was also like, like he was like, you know, traveling and, and talking to different people and like seeing someone appreciate. I just feel like food is like a really cool thing about people. Like it's so specific to them. Um, and so seeing him appreciate like the differences and both of like the cuisine and also being able to talk to different people. Um, I think that he brought a really interesting narrative to the table. This kind of building up what Chabu talked about, um, about like books. I um, definitely agree with like finding more sources of like slow media. Um, I really like investigative journalism pieces. Um, like, yeah, like I think I like go search for investigative journalism around like issues and that is like kind of where I get news. Um, I also like read a lot of Washington Post, um, but yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely second um, Vice and Anthony Bourdain. Like, I, okay, this sounds bad, but like I discovered Vice because for Model UN, I was getting really annoyed that everyone would come with these same like oh, I'm blah, 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 and I represent this country, and they're, like, coming at it from such, like, a whitewash perspective, and so, like, I discovered Vice when I was trying to, like, really get into, like, a country that I was supposed to be representing, um, and then, yeah, I think that, like, understanding someone's culture and not, like, oh, this is their culture, but, like, actually, like, going in and, like, experiencing it is really cool, and so, um, I don't know how good this show is, but I know my sister also really watches, like, this Gordon Ramsay show where he does the same thing where he'll, he'll like go and like cook with like people of like different cultures um and so I think like food is like something universal so maybe that's why like it's just really easy to connect people with um but then the last thing I'll say is just like um from other languages if that makes sense so, like I don't I'm not really like fluent in any other language but I'll like, try and like listen to things in like French which is like a language that I'm learning and like see their perspective on an issue because I feel like at least most of the things I consume are from like an American perspective. Um, and so just like seeing, I'm like, oh, how does the rest of the world view this? Or at least like another country is something that I try and do to like give myself a more global perspective. Martin, that is so cool. Um, my parents have started listening to news during lunch and they play like news from Taiwan. So I've literally been like, watching the U.S. election from a Taiwanese perspective. Ooh. It's incredibly interesting, like, and it has, like, caused me to think about things from, like, different perspectives that I, like, otherwise, like, wouldn't even have thought about. That's awesome. Yeah, that's super cool. I'm kind of curious, uh, like, what, what have they been saying? Yeah, like, I think, like, I don't know, I think it has caused me to think a lot more about, because, like, a lot of what their reporting is focusing on is like what like 
what like how will the outcome of like the election impact like U.S. China and Taiwan relations Mm -hmm. um apparently like yeah so like like a lot of it is like is around like China Taiwan relations and how like it's going to be Mm impacted yeah that's really interesting um Thank you guys for sharing. If you, if we, we can do like a quick little close, I know that was like last question, but just like if anyone wants to share how this was for them, um, you know, any thoughts, anything that they learned, feel free to go ahead and share. Well, I really enjoyed um, like listening to what everyone had to say today, especially because I think that I like undervalue the role that media has in like so I always think of it as like, oh, it's just a story. But like today, what we were talking about, it's like, oh, like these stories have the power to like influence real life. So like, even if it starts out as a story, it's like actually like just the course of how things happen. So I think that's really cool. And I really enjoyed like exploring that today. Yeah, like as always, it was really fun to talk to everyone here, but I'm also very curious and excited to go listen to, I don't know why that never crossed my mind, but um, to go listen to the news in Arabic. I think that that's going to be interesting, to say the least. Anyone else? I mean, this was a great conversation as always. And I think that in like the way that we've been uh, come across accustomed to media, I rarely think of it in the context of journalism. Um, And so it was really cool to just sit and think about that today with you guys. Yeah, I'll I'll, uh, second everything that everyone else has been saying and just the importance of discernment and understanding that the people who create media are people um, who have biases and flaws, et cetera. Um, And so it's really important to keep that all in perspective when digesting media. Okay, well, uh, thank you all for sharing and reflecting. Um, And thank you if you made it to the end of this video. Um, But we will see you soon. And the the next topic is to be decided. So (laughs) have a great night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.